Welcome to room nine, the region's largest classroom. I am Mrs. Wright, this is Molly, and I teach at Monroe Elementary in St. Charles. Today I will be teaching a reading lesson meant for second graders, but as always, everyone is welcome to learn with us. Molly is being very clingy today, but she doesn't really want to be on camera, I guess, since she hopped down. Um, I am excited because it's the final week of teaching in room nine for the fall season. And I was thinking about all of the things we've learned this season, and we have learned so much. You guys have worked so hard, and I'm really, really proud of you. I am excited this week because we are going to be focusing on comprehension, which is such an important part of reading. Because if you're comprehending what you're reading, that means that you're taking in and you're understanding the information that you're reading, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, whatever it might be. We're going to focus on fiction this week, comprehending fiction. So I am going to teach you some really important strategies for how you can better comprehend while you read. Um, Molly, do you want to say hi one last time before you go lay down? Come on. She has to get brushed today, so I think that's why she's pouting. Say hi. Come here. Say hi to our friends. Say hi one last time. Powder. She's pouting. All right. Probably won't be back on because you're kind of crabby. Dogs can be crabby too, apparently. Well, this one is at least. So I hope you guys are doing well. You're probably getting really close to your winter break and um, some of you might be virtual, some of you might be hybrid, some of you might be in person, and you might find it hard to like focus right now um, because you're so excited for winter break or things are just different right now. Um, so I just want to encourage you to keep working hard. Um, your teachers are so proud of all the hard work you've done. Um, this school year has been like nothing we've ever thought before, but I know that your teachers are so proud of you for persevering through these really weird times. And I'm proud of you too. And I'm happy that you're here um, and watching with me. So, or watching me and learning with me, I guess. I don't know. I, I learn something new every time I teach one of these lessons. So we are going this week to focus on, I will be able to use strategies to comprehend fiction texts. So we're focusing on understanding what we're reading, right? So reading is part um, understanding and decoding or decoding the words, figuring out the words, and part understanding um, and paying attention to what you're reading. So you can be someone who um, maybe decodes the words really well and figures them out, but then doesn't really pay attention to what they're reading or has a hard time understanding what they're reading. Um, so you, you could be someone though also who maybe knowing words, um, like you really don't have to try that hard to decode them, you just kind of know them. I don't know, I've met kids like that. That is not me and I've proven that on Teaching in Room 9, haven't I? How many times have I messed up a word while I'm recording, right? Um, and sometimes the comprehension or decoding is easier for you um, than, than the understanding. But either way, in order to be a successful reader, you need both, right? You need to be able to figure out and decode tricky words and you need to be able to understand um, not just the words you're reading, but the overall, all the words put together. What is this book trying to teach me? Whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Whew, I kind of rambled there. So we are going to get started with a strategy um, that is 
one of the most important strategies, I think, as a reader, because if you do this, then you will understand the text at a deeper level, okay? And that strategy is called questioning, okay? Questioning is where you ask yourself um, questions as you read, and then you might even have to ask questions um, to someone else that's reading with you, that you know has read the book before. So questioning just means you're trying to understand what's happening, okay? Or you might be trying to understand like the deeper levels of the book. So let me give you an example, but no, we're gonna save that. I'm gonna save that. Okay, so there are two types of questioning that are really important, okay? Questioning, you can use thin questions or you can use thick questions. Both of them are important, right? Because if you don't um, understand the thin questions, it's kind of hard to understand if you were really paying attention. And if you don't understand the thick questions, then you're never really pushing your thinking. So let me give you an example. A thin question is a question where the answer is right there, okay? So answer is right there. That means the answer is right in the text for you, okay? It's a who, what, when, where, how many kind of question. So who is the main character? Mrs. Wright is the main character. You can find it in, the answer to the question in the text right away, okay? A thick question is an answer that you have to think deeply about. Sometimes it's in the text, but sometimes it's not. So you have to think and search. Oops, spelled search wrong. C-A-R-C-H, there we go. So a thin question is an answer that is right there in the text for you. A thick question is an answer that you have to think and search for. So let me give you some examples of these. Some of these examples might be like thin questions, like I said, who, what, when, where, how many? And thick questions, I don't like that you can't see what I'm writing, so I'm gonna hang this up. I was gonna wait, but nope. Here we go. There we go. Thick questions are things that you're like, what if? Or you might be like, how? How? Does it feel? Okay, or you might say, what do you think? A big one with the questions is why? Why is this happening? What do you think? So, thin questions and thick questions are both important. You have to be able to answer both thin and thick questions about your text, okay? So we are going to read this book, but before we do that, I wanna do some stretches. Are you ready? So, oh, stretch up really, really, really high. Oh, stretch, stretch, stretch. Ooh, I felt that pop in my back. Did you hear that? Stretch my arm this way. Stretch this way. This way. This way. Whew, and I'm ready. Okay, I'm in the green zone and I'm ready to get started with learning. So we are going to start reading this book, Black, Blacksmith's 
song. Um, and this is being read with permission from Peachtree Publishing. And this, so a blacksmith is someone who works um, with metal um, and they like heat it up and then they mold it, um, bend it to how they need the metal to be formed, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and read the blurb for you. It says, Pa works hard as a blacksmith, but he's got another important job to do as well. Using his anvil, which is like the hammer type thing um, that he hits the metal with to form it. Um, using his anvil to pound out a message to travelers on the Underground Railroad. When Pa falls ill, who will take over? So that means when Pa gets sick, who is going to take over? Um, there's an author's note that I wanted uh, to start with. So we're going to start there. It says, author's note. Blacksmith's song is fiction, but it is inspired by stories about communication along the Underground Railroad. Neither a railroad nor underground, the Underground Railroad was a secret, thus underground. Network of trails, meeting points, and safe houses that enslaved people used to escape, mostly to the north and Canada. There they could live as th free men and women. Along the way, they were aided by their fellow slaves, free-born black people, Native Americans, and white abolitionists. Railroad terminology was used to refer to aspects of the journey. Escapees were called travelers, those who guided them, conductors, and stopping places, stations. The Underground Railroad was most active beginning around 1830 and throughout the Civil War. Somewhere between 25,000 and 100,000 people may have escaped using this route, out of more than 4 million enslaved. Aiding escaped slaves was illegal, even in the North. Violating the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 could result in punishment of six months in prison and a $1,000 fine. An enslaved person who was caught trying to escape or aid another another's escape would be brutally punished and often sold. Enslaved people were, of course, prohibited from talking to each other about methods and routes for escape. Doing so would have been incredibly dangerous. There are many theories about how they might have communicated with each other about the Underground Railroad, but little evidence to support these beliefs. Some methods described in folklore are visual, such as quilts and dance, and others are oral, like code songs, like code word songs, and perhaps the rhythm of a blacksmith's hammer. Okay, here we go. So, thick and thin questions. I'm going to ask both thick and thin questions as I read. Pa is tired and looking feverish, but he's already up and blowing on the fire when I get up. He doesn't answer my words. He doesn't answer. Am I? Oh my gosh, I'm already skipping things. Let me just boop, boop, restart. Pa is tired and feverish looking, but he's already blow, up and blowing on the fire when I get up. Let me help, Pa, I say. He doesn't answer, and my words drift away like smoke. His muscles glisten. He's working hard. But the sound from his anvil has no rhythm this afternoon. It's an ordinary song for an ordinary day. Okay, so a thin question might be, who is, who, what is this man's job? And the answer would be, he is a blacksmith. And then um, a thick question might be, hmm, why? Why didn't he answer his son when his son said, let me help, Pa? Why didn't he answer him? So that's an example of a thin question, a question I can find right in the text, and a thick question. Some evening, Pa, some evenings, Pa pounds out the blacksmith's song.
a deep down rhythm from the hammer striking anvil. The sound grows louder faster as his tap, tap, tapping tells listening ears and hearts that the waiting is nearly over. Tonight he is sending word to the folks in the woods who are waiting to hear when it's time to leave. I wonder who's in the woods. Ma, I ask, when will it be our turn? Soon, she whispers. You be ready when Pa plays for us. I'm ready now, I tell her. I'm only nine, but the song of leaving is in my heart too. That night, sounds scratch at my dreams, trying to get in. Are the people out there afraid in the darkness? I will be, will I be brave when it's our turn to go? Hmm. So a question that would be a thick question in this in this scenario is, who do you think he's saying is in the woods? Who who is he referring to? Is in the woods. That would be a thick question. So go ahead. Who do you think he's talking about is in the woods waiting? Yes, runaway slaves, right? Yes, I agree. So then a thin question would be, how does Pa help with the Underground Railroad? Hmm. How does Pa help with the Underground Railroad? Okay, let's keep reading. I think it's right in the text for us. The next day we go about our business. Though he is weak, Pa makes horseshoes and wagon wheels. Ma cooks and serves, and I take care of the chickens. Give me all your eggs, I tell the hen, so Ma can make lots of cakes for the misses. The hens don't care about cakes. They just care about me taking away what's theirs. Same as us. I practice tapping Pa's rhythms on the hen house, but it worries the chickens, so I quit. About noontime, some white people drive up to the master's house in their fine carriages. Later, Ma tells us what she heard while she was serving dinner. Those white people were looking for their slaves who ran away in the night. Has anyone heard after them, they ask? No, says the master. Good thing they don't ask Ma. Why is it a good thing that they didn't ask Ma? That would be another thick question. Why do you think it's a good thing they didn't ask Ma? Yeah, because she knows, right? Who are the white people looking for? That's what they call them, white people. Who are they looking for? So you should be able to go back to the text and find this one. This is a thin question. It's a right there question. It's answered for you. Yep, you got it. The white people were looking for their runaway slaves. Tell me again how you learned the traveling rhythm, I asked Pa the next morning. So that must be how Pa helps with the Underground Railroad. I, I like to hear the story again and again. Sparks fly from his hammer. I learned it from my Pa, he says, just like he learned it from his. Grandpa noticed the rhythms first and put some meaning to them. Soon the understanding of it spread to others. Now lots of folks use those same rhythms to tell about the Freedom Trail. Let me try, I beg. I'm ready now. Pa puts down his hammer and wipes his sweaty face with a rag. He looks frail. That means like tired or weak. Soon, he says. I pick up his hammer and strike the anvil. Not now, he whispers. Later. The master comes in. Has he heard us? Are you done with the present for the missus? He asked Pa. It's almost time for her birthday party. I'm working on it now, Pa says. A bird slowly emerges from a piece of hot iron as Pa shapes its berth with a hammer and a tong. This will sit atop the garden gate, he tells the master. What is Pa making for the missus' birthday? 
You're right. That's an example of a right there thin question. He's making a bird. As the sun sets, word seeps down to us. Most folks are coming along the Freedom Trail. It's almost time for a song from the blacksmith. Will this be our time to leave as well? Pause, rhythms begin. Tapping softly, tap, tap, tapping. I stomp my feet to the rhythm. I clap my hands. I compound this rhythm out just like Pa does. Hammer strikes anvil. I sway to the rhythms and listen. Anvil must be metal because if it hammer strikes. Clearly I got that wrong. Hmm. So that's kind of an example of what I was just thinking aloud of a thick question. Well, I guess that anvil is not the hammer because it's saying hammer strikes anvil. So maybe anvil is the metal. See, questioning. I'm thinking about what I'm reading. The moon is a stingy slice and dark surrounds our, our cabin. I hear whispers and footsteps and dogs, and then there's the steady clump of horses' hooves and white men's voices. I hold my breath until I'm ready to burst. Pa comes in late when it's quiet again. Sleeping is sparse in our cabin. Our ears don't quit listening until dawn. That means they're not sleeping a lot. After I tended the chickens the next morning, I go help Pa. The fever has gripped him bad, but he's hard at work at his anvil. Ooh, so maybe that's the anvil, this big thing. Maybe that's what, like, you put the metal on that and then hit the hammer with the metal. So that must be the anvil there. So pictures help answer your thick questions too. Mid-morning, the master pays another call. Why were you at your forge so late last night, he asked Pa. I was finishing the garden gate for the Mrs. Birthday, Pa says. On the day of the party, Pa and I placed the new gate at the entrance to the rose garden. He is so weak that I have to help him. The fancy folks marvel at pa Pa's artistry. Music plays and people laugh and talk. I sense an unfelt rhythm, an unheard song. Surely it will be soon for us. What do you think he means by soon for us? And is that a thick question or a thin question? It's a thick question because if we knew, he wouldn't keep saying soon it would be, it would be for us, right? So it's a thick question. Hmm, but what do you think he's talking about? Hmm. But how will Pa pound out the news to everybody else when he's feeling so poorly? In bed, I hear the noise of the party, but not the sound I've been waiting for. Pa lies on his pallet, weak and feverish and unable to send out the traveling rhythm. My eyes won't close. I tap out a message on my hand, just for me. Ma arrives late. Quickly, she whispers to Pa, it's time. He tries to get up, but he doesn't have the strength. She looks at him and then at me. We both know. I have to do it, I tell her. I have to be the one to send the news. I try not to think about the dark and the danger waiting outside, and maybe the dogs. What does he have to do? Yep, you're right, he has to play the song, the blacksmith song. I pick up a hammer in the blacksmith's shed. I choose the smallest one. I know my size. I can still hear the music and laughter from the party. But another rhythm beats in my heart and soul, just like it does in Paz and did in his Paz before that. I strike the anvil and send the message to those waiting in the woods who are hoping to hear the blacksmith's song. So what does he do? That's a thin question because it's right there. You're right. He hits the anvil with the hammer to play the blacksmith song. Good. Why does he do it? That right there, what I just said, that's a thick question. Okay? So he's doing it because he is sending a message to the people in the woods who are waiting that are part of the runaway slaves in the Underground Railroad. So he's giving them the clear, like, it's good to go. 
At last, it's our turn too. We wait to leave until the party is loudest. Ma and I have to help Pa up the hill. Then we hurry to the woods. Just before we step into the thicket of trees, the three of us turn to look at the blacksmith's shed one last time. In the darkness, the forge still glows with the heat of Pa's last song. And my first. Pa's anvil is silent now, but maybe soon its message will be heard again. When another blacksmith picks up a hammer and sends others on their journey. He presses something into my hand. It's an iron star. To light our way to freedom, he whispers. That's where they're going, to freedom. Okay, so I really like this book, Blacksmith's Song. And if you notice, like a lot of the questioning that was happening while I was reading was natural, right? Like I didn't plan any questions out for this book. Some of them were thin, like, wait, who did that? Where, how many were people were there? Who is the master? What was he making for the missus? So those types of questions, those are the right, <clears throat> excuse me, those are the right there questions. Those are the questions that are in the text for you already. The thick questions are the ones where you might have to think or search a little bit harder for the answer. They're the ones that are like, why, what if, what might, um, but why is that happening? Well, I think, I guess, right? So there's the, they're the questions that maybe the answer's there, but maybe not, okay? All right, readers, you did such a great job with this comprehension strategy. Um, remember that questioning is so important as you read. Questioning as you read will help you to understand the text more deeply. All right? Bye, guys. See you next time. in Room 9 is made possible with support of Bank of America, Dana Brown Charitable Trust, Emerson, and viewers like you.